Hey guys, welcome to the channel. If you are tuning in, this is part two of my three-part budget series. If you didn't check out the first one, I'm gonna link it down below. I will also clip it at the end of this video so you can check it out. But I am sharing in today's video how I prioritize our budget. I had one specific subscriber ask me, how do you know what to get first and what do you prioritize? And so I thought, let me just share with you guys my thought process and how I choose where to spend our money when it comes to our homeschool budget. My name is Morgan here at The Life of Tillman's. If this is your first time, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. If you've been here before, welcome back. My first question is I'm going to ask is, why do we set a budget? Me, I set a budget so that I don't go over. So I don't overspend, you guys. That is always the goal is to not overspend because we all know that it is so easy to overspend when we are shopping for homeschool stuff. It's like you look up and you're like, wait, I wasn't supposed to buy all this where did all the money go and i'm still missing some things so that is why i prioritize what i'm buying within our homeschool as a part of our budget so the first thing i'm going to talk about is how i set a budget in previous years sometimes i just go off of the previous year's budget right you may not have that as an option, but that is sometimes how I do it. In other years, I've also just looked at my needs of the students, my girls. What is it that they are specifically needing and how can I make sure that we stay within our budget and also meet the girls' needs? And so if this is your first time budgeting, things that I did back when I was first starting was I set a budget per child, just a blanket amount. Everyone gets this specific amount and that's where we're gonna stay. I will say to do that, it's better to overestimate, okay? So if you can fit that into your budget, make sure you overestimate as opposed to underestimating and then you find yourself going over, then you feel like you failed, you know, you don't wanna go through all of that. <laughs> but also you have to consider what you can afford. So even though you may say, this is the blanket amount that I wanna set, can you afford that amount? per child. I've said it before, I will say it again. You want to make sure that your budget fits your finances and not your finances fitting your budget. You don't want to make a budget for finances that you don't have. <laughs> you can't do that because then you're already setting yourself up to fail, okay? All right, so the next thing when setting a budget is I have to prioritize what we're going to do, who I'm going to buy it for, because I have three girls. And so if I don't set just a blanket amount for the girls, I have to think about who am I buying for first and why? So in the past, I have done where I purchase for the child who's, who's the most challenging at the moment. Not that the child themselves are challenging, but providing curriculum that meets their needs can be a little bit more challenging. I would start with that child. This past year, my focus was on my youngest daughter because she was learning how to read. And I'm like, we gotta set a really solid foundation for her when it comes to her reading. This year, I actually started with the child who is transitioning the most. And that actually is my oldest daughter because we are trying to prepare her for high school. And so I am looking not just at this upcoming seventh grade year, but eighth all the way up into her 12th grade year for graduation. So that has really been the area and the person that I've been focused more on and putting a little bit more money into her budget to make sure that I meet that immediate need and prepare her for the future. The other question that people ask was, how do you determine what curriculum to get and how do you prioritize curriculum? So I'm just gonna speak for me. I always start with core stuff first. Core for me is math, language arts, and those are probably about equal. Okay, I do love math more. But then I move on to science and then I move on to history. Everything else after that is like extra stuff and it does not even get considered until I have set the solid foundation for those four areas. And that's usually for my older girls. My youngest daughter, I'm really not heavily focusing on science and history because she does that with her older siblings. But math and ELA, absolutely, we are focusing on those things first for each one of my girls. After that, then I move on to things like a foreign language, uh, geography, art, electives that they may want to do, things like coding or uh, wood shop, typing, wherever else we need to go. But I have to get those four done, which is the math, the ELA, science and history before I move on to anything else. Then I have to think about any specialized areas. So this year I'm wanting to study some civics and government. It's an election year, right? So that's like the perfect timing. So that's an added thing that I would consider to be an elective. On top of that, I save 25 to 30% of my overall budget 
for each child for supplements. I typically do not buy supplements at the beginning of the school year, unless I know for a fact, based off of the previous year and how we're ending the school year, that my girls may need a little bit of help in a specific area, because that to me is what a supplement is all about. It is to boost up your current curriculum. It is to add in additional work for your child and practice work so that they can master a concept. But I don't wanna buy those at the beginning of the year thinking that we may need them because that's how you end up with a ton of stuff in your homeschool that you don't use. And I've been there, done that. I'm cleaning out my homeschool room right now. And so don't do that. I wait until I see a need. I do know that there are some needs ending this current school year that we're gonna work on over the summer and into the fall. So there are some supplements that I'm going to be purchasing, but I am not going to purchase a supplement for six, eight months from now because my daughters may not need it and it's such a waste of money. So I wanna make sure that I sit that money aside for when I do need it so that it's there and I'm not scrambling to try to find it because I've overspent on my budget. Once that portion is done, I've hit up the four curriculum areas, I've added in some different things like art and geography and things like that, and I've also considered supplements, then I move on to extracurriculars, additional electives, and field trips. And some may say, but field trips are a must. They're not. They're not a must as far as uh, finances are concerned because those would be in my household the first thing to go if I cannot provide anything for my girls because I can create a fun experience that is a field trip that will not cost us anything. But when I'm talking about field trips, we have a lot of like different places like museums and uh, nature centers and things like that that have homeschool days here because we have a really large homeschool community where we live. And so those homeschool days are always cheaper, if not free for our families. So I search, I have been searching every single year and I put things on a list, I keep track of field trips that we've taken in the previous years and those locations because they run those homeschool years all year long, every single year. So if we want to go back to some of the same places, we absolutely can. If we wanna add new places, I do that as well. There's tons of Facebook groups for us that uh, give us direction as to where we can go for homeschool field trips and it just makes it a lot easier. But I do set aside a budget, a budget for extracurricular activities, field trips and electives. When it comes to choosing extracurriculars, guys, my youngest gets the cheap to free stuff. I'm talking, if you've ever heard of it, but like YMCA sports, which is not competitive at all. It's entry level things all the way up until sixth, seventh, eighth grade. They're still entry level, but that is just to get her feet wet so that they can figure out what they want to do. All of my girls start out doing extracurriculars in that form because they don't know what they want. You're just introducing them to a ton of things. And my husband and I firmly believe that it is great to introduce your child to as many opportunities for extracurriculars and electives as possible when they're younger, because when they start getting into middle school and high school, it's kind of like, okay, Let's see what you really like so we can really hone in and focus on those things. So we've done that with our girls. We have one now who is like hardcore volleyball. We have one who's still kind of in the middle trying to figure out exactly between two different sports. And then we have our youngest daughter who's just trying everything that she can possibly get her hands on. And as they get older, they start to weed out some of those things just naturally for them. They'll say they don't like it and that's okay. So that's how we do extracurricular. So we set a budget and we know typically what extracurriculars will cost based off of the previous year. We set our budget for that. We add about 10 to 15% to it and that's where we stay. We also talk to our girls about participating in one sport per season. So they may get to play volleyball, basketball, and soccer all in a single school year, but they are not doing all of those at the same time. Each one of our girls can participate in one thing per season, as long as it fits the schedule and doesn't run me wild, and it has to stay within budget. I hope this was helpful for you guys. I'll see y'all for part three. Bye.